Subscribers to The Australian hear episodes first and get access to all Shari's work on this topic, as well as unrivaled news, politics, investigations, sport and culture. Go to theaustralian.com.au slash Wuhan to find out more. I'm Shari Markson, and I've spent most of the past two years investigating the origins of COVID-19. 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 The Chinese city of Wuhan is under quarantine as the outbreak of the coronavirus worsens. The federal government has raised its travel advice for the Chinese provinces to Wuhan and Huabei to level four. This is the front line of the epidemic in Wuhan, and it is bleak. I'm declaring a public health emergency of international concern over the global outbreak of novel coronavirus. What really happened in Wuhan? In a red brick townhouse near Capitol Hill, inside Washington, D.C.'s famous Beltway, lives a petite 70-year-old woman with long black hair and a warm smile. Her name, Diamond Liu. She's famous for her parties, her flair for Cantonese cooking, and her love of good conversation and bringing people together. She's also one of the world's leading human rights advocates. Diamond grew up in mainland China during the so-called Great Leap Forward. And she nearly starved to death as a child. When she was 11, her mum was so worried that Diamond wouldn't survive, she put her on a train with a falsified visa and helped her escape. Diamond eventually forged a career and life in the United States, and for a time at Hong Kong University, where she had a teaching position until the horror of the Tiananmen Square massacre. When I began investigating and writing my book, a good China contact said I had to speak to Diamond. My contact described her this way. She's very hard-nosed, has lobbied a lot on the hill, Married to Bob Sutinger, a very fine CIA China analyst, now retired. She has also got people out of China. She rubs a lot of people up the wrong way. I love her. We row all the time. But she's a wonderful woman. And if anyone can get to the information you need, it's probably her. Of course, I followed up and got in contact with Diamond. And it didn't take me long to realise that she had an incredible story of her own. It starts on Chinese New Year 2020. On January uh, 25th, I was uh, uh, giving um, a Chinese New Year's party, which I I did for a long time, for 20 years, for more like 30 years, almost every year. And uh, Matt Pottinger had already said he would come to the dinner. And... And that's when uh, Matt and uh, Wei had their conversation. Matt Pottinger was Trump's deputy national security advisor. He's a regular at Diamond's home. She trusts him. And from time to time, she passes on valuable information she hears from her Chinese contacts. I mean, lots of people talk to Matt. Matt is uh, very approachable. Um, I would never uh, say that uh, I were ever... Matt's uh, advisor, because it's not true. But, you know, for any policymaker um, who are worth their salt, they talk to a lot of people. Um, and, um, and I certainly find that, you know, Matt um, um, is very knowledgeable. Um, which is not always true of policymakers. Um, But in this case, you know, um, Matt Pottinger is very able and very knowledgeable. And uh, and we are very lucky to have him. This night, on Chinese New Year 2020, Diamond wanted to connect Matt with one of her oldest friends in the Chinese dissident community, Wei Jingsheng. He's known as the father of China's democracy movement, a man who spent 18 years in Chinese prisons before famously defecting to the US in 1997, a release negotiated by Diamond's own husband, who was then working at the Clinton White House 
as China Director of the National Security Council. In 97, Bob sat down with the first secretary of the Chinese embassy in Washington and negotiated Wei's release and deportation to the US. Now, Wei had valuable information about the new coronavirus in Wuhan, and what he would say to Matt Pottinger that night changed the course of history. He said he would never forget it. But Matt is, um, you know, Matt, I have never seen Matt uh, exaggerate, so so he's a very understated uh, kind of person. Wei had first told Diamond there was a new coronavirus spreading in Wuhan a full two months earlier. It was on November the 22nd in 2019 when Wei came to Diamond and Bob's home for ribeye steak and stir-fried bean curd. Over the sizzling Chinese Western fusion, Wei told Diamond what he knew. Diamond, let's start with the night Wei Jingsheng came over for dinner at your house on November 22. What was different about that night? There was an urgency about um, Wei's manner. I mean, Wei normally is a very relaxed person. And since we are such old friends, so conversations have always been very relaxed. But um, that night was a little bit different because he talked um, in, a, in a, almost a different tone and he talked it almost um, nonstop uh, throughout the dinner, and and I was um, in in a listening mode. But in a way, I couldn't quite believe what he was saying. Uh, at that time, everything was new, and I had thought that uh, the coronavirus could not be worse than SARS. And SARS, um, as we knew from experience, was not that contagious. And it could be, it was and it could be contained. And I thought at the time uh, that was the case, you know. Okay, there was an outbreak, uh, but the authorities and uh, advance of uh, medical sciences would be able to contain the spread of this virus. This was November 2019. It was just so early. This is six weeks before the World Health Organization would discover that there was a virus spreading in Wuhan. What specifically did Wei say to you that night at dinner? Well, he he discounted several theories. Uh, one was the um, the animal to human trans- transmission, and uh, the wet market theory. He he said was only possible if the lab had sold uh, uh, laboratory uh, animals which had already been um, uh, infected uh, to the market. Uh, you know, for 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 money. You know, uh, um, he, you know, because the way it was um, uh, uh, broken out, um, he didn't think that was a possibility. He was quite systematic in his discount of the wet market theory. Did he think at that point, because you had two uh, meals with him, the one was in January, January the 2nd, and this first one was November 22nd. That's right. At that, at that earlier dinner, did he think this was a coronavirus? Uh, he, yes, he did say it was coronavirus. Um, the other thing that was different about this uh, dinner was that the night before, November 21st, there was a Uyghur dissident, who uh, quite a famous Uyghur uh, a dissident, uh, who was visiting the United States and was planning to come to dinner, but Wei didn't want to come to the dinner with a uh, with a, di- a Uyghur dissident. He wa- he obviously had something to say, something he wanted to tell me, 
and um, and he chose to come the next day. And when he said what that there was a new coronavirus spreading in Wuhan in November, how extensive did he say the spread was, and and how did he know about it? Well, in the, um, uh, among the Chinese uh, um, uh, di- diaspora and among you know the, uh, medical communities. Um, and among the the chat groups, uh, there there have been talks about it. And Wei, being who who he is, uh, tend to be uh, the recipients of um, many information. People seek him out, um, and and Wei being very alert, um, he saw the danger way before I did. I, you know. I have to say I did not take it all that serious. Uh, uh, neither the 20, uh, uh, November 22nd nor the January uh, 2nd uh, dinner because I always thought is uh, it would be easy to contain. Well, there was nothing in the news at the time. I mean, it was no one had mentioned no. a thing. No, no one had mentioned a day, a thing. But I did think it. Um, uh, important enough that I thought of writing a memo to uh, Matt Pottinger. But some of the things Wei was saying, uh, I had no way to verify. You know, I, um, I do understand that when you have a hypothesis about um, an event and, and a theory, it needs to be tested. Um, until it is tested, uh, the theory remains a uh, hypothesis. And, 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 and for me, I, I have no way uh, to, to test it. You know, I'm not trained to test such a theory. Um, so I, I thought it was important that uh, Matt Pottinger hears directly from way rather than from me, rather you know one uh, one layer removed. And on January twenty uh, fifth, I was um, uh, giving um, a Chinese New Year's party, which I I did for a long time for twenty years, for th- m- more like thirty years, almost every year. And uh, Matt Pottinger had already said he would come to the dinner, and, and that's when the Matt and uh, Wei had their conversation. After that momentous dinner, Wei arrived unannounced for lunch on the 2nd of January. From almost the moment he walked through their door, he could speak of little else other than the coronavirus. Uh, in fact, he, he, uh, um, he just show up. He call before and then he show up. So that is not something we um, uh, normally uh, does. He, you know, we always make appointment. I always um, uh, cook a special dinner for him um, uh, with the food that he likes. Um, but um, but that was different. He just wanted to 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 talk. And what did he say when he burst through the door that day? Um, he said that people are, um, are getting sicker and then more people are getting sicker. Um, uh, more people are getting sick and, and, and when they get sick, they get sicker. And, um, and that was also the time that um, uh, doctors who uh, know something about the virus are being um, silenced. Um, and we hear that and 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 um, and Wei was hearing that. So we, we, Wei realized that uh, things are getting more serious. And when he came over on January 2nd and he was more alarmed, at that point, what did he say to you about the source of the virus? He speculated that it was a lab leak. Um, Yes, yes. On January 2nd, that early? 
And what did he say? Did he did he point to the Wuhan Institute of Virology, or what did he say about a potential lab leak? Well, he did mention uh, the um, the name um, of this woman doctor who who's uh, a major researcher at the Wuhan Institute of uh, Virology. Um, I didn't know her name um, because it's not something I follow. Um, it's not my area. So it, it was the first time I heard her name. Uh, but it is not just uh, the Wuhan Institute, although uh, we have more information about the Wuhan Institute. There are also other uh, Wuhan labs that um, uh, that do the gain of function uh, research, and um, and the French uh, 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 scientists have um, published papers about those other labs. Um, but Wuhan is definitely a major center of research on the, um, on gain of function. And during that lunch, did you discuss how? this virus came to be spreading in Wuhan, whether it was accidental, deliberate. What were some of the theories that Wei discussed with you then? Well, I did ask Wei uh, the question that could that be intentional? Um, it was just a question because I, I, I knew nothing. Uh, Wei said at the time uh, when the uh, CCP power elite I engage in power struggle. There's nothing um, that they wouldn't do. Um, they, uh, the baseline, uh, they can descend to um, is very low, he said. Meo uh, descend is basically it's a very common uh, description of the CCP that they would um, sing essentially means that you know, th there's just no bottom that they wouldn't sink to. And when he said this to you, and when he was telling you and Bob on January 2nd, just how worried he was about the spread of this new coronavirus, what did you say to each other? Um, I mean, Wei was worried. I could see that he was worried. Um, you know, Wei cares about the Chinese people. He cares about people. Um, he have uh, put his life on the line in protecting um, other people. So I, I see the seriousness of um, um, of the situation, but frankly, I didn't know what to do. And you started writing a memo to Matt Pottinger after that January second lunch. Yes, but I didn't send it to him because there are so many things were so incredulous was so hard to believe, uh, and so many things that I didn't understand. Uh, I wrote it, but I didn't send it, um, because I decided it's better that way talks directly to uh, Matt Pottinger. And Matt, when Matt, you know, Matt worked very hard, um, you know, everybody at the National Security Council uh, works very hard. It's just a very tough job. And so when Matt finally showed up at the dinner, it was, uh, you know, way past, uh, way, you know, it's almost uh, nine o'clock. It's, it's late. And I could see he had just come directly from work. Um, so I led him to, to Wei. Um, we had something like about 80 people um, in, in that uh, party. Um, and there was a lot of things for me to do. Normally, you know, I would uh, interpret for Wei, uh, but since um, Matt is uh, fluent in, um, in Mandarin, uh, I just left them to it. So I actually did not know uh, what was the exchange between Wei and um, and, and, and Matt, I just went and took care of uh, other guests. That Chinese New Year changed the course of history. <laughs> it's uh, a, a, a little amazing because, you know, when I left my um, 
tenure position at the University of Hong Kong, I wanted to, um, to change uh, the course of China policy, which even um, in 1989, I thought it was on the wrong course. And I thought that too in 1972. <laughs> but, um, but, but after 1989, I, I decided to do something about it. So, um, of course, we cannot say, you know, if we um, uh, would ever succeed at such a, a difficult task as changing China policy, but, but we must try. Uh, we must do the best we can because so many lives are depending on it. After Wei came over unannounced on January 2nd, where he was clearly so concerned about the spread of the virus and what was happening to doctors, what, what were your thoughts after that visit? Frankly, I was scared. Um, you know, I, I knew Wei uh, since um, he left China in 1997. And, and I have uh, known him um, well over the years and and I could see he was very concerned, very um, uh, very uh, uh, ver worried and it is not a state I have observed very often before. Um, he just happened to be a very calm person but you can see the concern on his face what did you and Bob say to each other after that lunch, after hearing about this virus? We didn't say anything. We kind of stared at each other and, 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 uh, and we said nothing because we were so stunned. But we looked at each other and wondering, now what do we do? And Diamond, you have with you right now the memo that you wrote to Matt but didn't send. What, is, what does that memo say? Can you read that to us? Um, the memo has uh, four points. And I can read it now. Number one, we centered the outbreak entirely on lab leaks, either through incompetence, accident, negligence, corruption, or intention. Wei mentioned that he knew the PLA has been doing research on biological warfare since the 1960s. Two, Wei mentioned the Shi Zhengli's name and the Wuhan Virology Institute as one of the labs suspected. Three, Wei systematically and emphatically ruled out that it was a natural animal uh, to human transmission that occurred through the wet market. The wet market theory is only likely, Wei said, if the a very vicious lab technician sold the used and infected bats to the wet market. Four, I asked Wei if there is any possibility that she or she's political allies released the virus. Wei said, such possibility always exists because the power elite would do anything to gain advantage during power struggles. Even then, Wei Lin tossed Xi as the culprit. If the virus release were indeed intentional, because Xi controls the military, and the military controls the research in biological warfare. That's just extraordinary level of information for Wei to have on January 2nd, as the rest of the world hadn't even found out yet that there was a virus spreading in Wuhan. Yeah, I did find the information uh, extraordinary. That's why that I didn't send the memo. Um, I wanted uh, Matt to talk to Wei directly. And hear the information firsthand. Yeah, so he would have it firsthand. Were you worried he wouldn't believe you? No, it's just that I thought we have time. There was no indication this was urgent. I didn't, yes. And I always thought it was containable. Because we've never seen a global pandemic like this. <laughs> yes. The next thing that we saw in China 
was the most egregious cover-up of this virus. Um, that's something the CCP does very well, cover up. <laughs> it's part of their playbook. It's part of the playbook and they have a lot of experience in doing so. How, I mean, th this cover up even extended to doctors, journalists, business people going missing, some never to be seen again. What happens when people go missing like this in China? Well, people go missing all the time. Um, I grew up um, in China. Uh, as a child, I saw people disappear. And, and you don't dare to answer que uh, ask questions because you would uh, be taking a chance of being disappeared as well. Uh, of course, you know, um, my family is, uh, was a little bit different. We were categorized as the one of the, or two of, or several of the bad elements, you know. Uh, hey, we lay. So we were um, discriminated against by definition. Um, so if something were to happen, uh, it would happen to us first. So we were even more careful in not um, uh, speaking. Now, Wei comes from uh, one of the 500 families that established um, the PRC, the original 500 family. And um, so he was one of the princeling, and as a princeling, uh, they have more freedom. They have more leeway, uh, unlike uh, the bad five elements. Uh, basically, <laughs> you are guilty as a definition, by definition. So he had, he had always had more freedom to act on uh, his conscience. How impeccable are Wei's connections in China, in the Communist Party? Well, if you are one of the 500 family, then you are among the power elite. He, um, he uh, is, was an insider. He chose to be an outsider. Uh, he chose to act on his conscience. Um, he is a man with more courage than anybody I have ever met. And I met a lot of very famous uh, uh, dissonants. He spent 18 years of his life in prison fighting the Chinese Communist Party. He is um, the most effective uh, in, in his fight because he understands the system. He understands how politics are played inside the black box. Um, my understanding of the Chinese Communist Party would uh, benefit a great deal from, uh, from his knowledge. And even after his 18 years in prison, after your husband Bob helped secure his defection, to the United States, he still maintains very high-level contacts in the Communist Party. I think people saw, uh, seek him out, um, and important people seek him out. Um, yeah, his <laughs> information are quite remarkably uh, accurate and present. And I'm not saying this um, uh, in a short duration or time frame, as I have known him since, you know, he, he, he went into exile from China in 1997. The information Wei Jingsheng and other dissidents passed on to Matt Pottinger at Diamond's New Year party was critical. In another episode of this podcast, you'll hear Wei speak directly about what he told Matt about the Wuhan Institute and the military games. But he also told Matt just how contagious the virus was. Matt Pottinger, in an interview for my book, said what he learned at the party was that the epidemic was much worse than China was admitting and that it had spread far beyond Wuhan. Beijing was in crisis too. 
The next day, Pottinger hit the phones and his body of on-the-ground information grew. By the end of that Sunday, he knew he needed to raise the alarm inside the White House. From what he'd learned in just 24 hours, Matt was now acutely aware that the administration was not taking this seriously enough. Back at work on the Monday, he called a meeting for the very next day and it was attended by Health Secretary Alex Azar, the Centres for Communicable Diseases Director Robert Redfield, Anthony Fauci and Deputy Secretary of State Stephen Began. At this meeting, Pottinger raised the idea of shutting down travel from China, but no one supported it. They thought it was absurd. It took Pottinger and his boss, National Security Advisor Robert O'Brien, that entire week to convince Trump and his senior team that there needed to be a travel ban from China. And this was eventually announced on the Friday by Alex Azar. Until that point, Wuhan was in a strict lockdown, but China was still allowing 28 international flights out every day. They decided to cover it up. Well, there's one thing that really disturbed me. They stopped at uh, internal traveling to and from Wuhan, but they allow um, foreign travel from Wuhan to other countries. That is really disturbing. If they knew um, the danger of transmission uh, inside China, why wouldn't they do the same for the rest of the world? So what is the Chinese Communist Party agenda here? What have we seen in how they've handled the outbreak of a deadly coronavirus? What's their intentions here? Do they, the, the, the cover-up of the virus, the fact that it's infected, you know, the US, Australia, the fact that the economic coercion in Australia, trade retaliation, just for calling for an investigation into the origin. What's their overall end goal? What does the Chinese Communist Party want? I mean, is it, is it for want of a, of a better phrase, um, to extend their reach globally? What, what are, and what's their end goal? As domination. This is a systems uh, a contest, which President Biden has very clearly um, articulated, and rightly so. This is uh, a systems uh, contest. It is um, democracy where um, freedom is protected, uh, to tyranny where freedom is trampled. And these two do not and cannot coexist. Um, even though democracy since 1972 uh, have wanted and have tried it to coexist with tyranny, but tyranny would not abide by co coexistence uh, when it's strong. And clearly, China is strong. Now, many take um, comfort in saying um, the United States still have a larger um, uh, GDP and by you know exchange rate uh, uh, you know the United States does have a larger uh, GDP but if you uh, measure by uh, uh, PPP um, purchase power parity um, China actually has a uh, a larger GDP uh, than the United States, and also a larger G GDP than European Union. So China is, in, in fact, stronger than the United States um, and stronger than the uh, Euro European Union. So why would they uh, abide by coexistence when they're stronger? They don't need to. Now, the second thing that uh, China uh, uh, party, the CCP party's uh, state is stronger because they have system superiority in both control and efficiency. Now, uh, um, China, China um, the Beijing actually controls 56% of its GDP. Uh, while 
um, United States controls, 34%, and European Union controls, uh, uh, 34%, uh, United States controls, uh, 33%. Uh, but in the, in the United States, most of that um, GDP of that 33% go to the military and social service. Uh, they only control directly 10% of deploy, uh, deployable uh, GDP. You know, when you know, China, uh, because of the system, can control up to 90% of its GDP just by issuing decrees. While European uh, countries and the United States uh, to gain more control of their uh, resources, they had to go through democratic procedures. And that takes time and do not always come with um, the wanted outcome. So in fact, um, because of the system superiority in both control and efficiency, China is stronger. So, I mean, all this complacency uh, among democratic government is due to their lack of knowledge of the CCP party state. We don't have that much time to confront them, to protect ourselves and to protect our freedom. Um, you know, people don't notice the suffering and the death of the Chinese people. If they had paid more attention, they would not be in the current predicament. The Chinese people's experience under the CCP is very il illustrative of what the CCP would do to the rest of the world. We cannot, we simply cannot assume that the CCP would treat the rest of the world better than their own people. Even though we're in different parts of the world, I've grown to know Diamond well over the past year through many, many conversations and lengthy interviews. She gave me this incredible insight into the way the communist regime treats its own people. She herself nearly died as a child from starvation and infection. She loves China and her cooking is an emotional link to the land of her birth. But she's enraged that the regime is inflicting horrors on its own people. And she has absolutely no faith in Beijing's intentions and actions. It was interesting to see that almost everyone was prepared to give China the benefit of the doubt, except for dissidents like Wei and Diamond, who've seen and suffered so much. What Really Happened in Wuhan is presented by The Australian. It's written and produced by me, Shari Markson, and The Australian's editorial director, Claire Harvey. It was produced by Liat Samaglu. My book, What Really Happened in Wuhan, is available online at Amazon, in bookstores in Australia at Dimox, or wherever you buy your books.